The sun was beginning to set, casting an ethereal glow over the streets of Maibashi. I found myself wandering through the quiet town, my heart heavy with uncertainty. The weight of my financial struggles and lack of meaningful connections was too much to bear. I was feeling lost, lonely, and regretting my choices. As I continued my nightly stroll, it started to rain. How fitting. I passed my neighbor, who warned me to go back home, but I didn't listen. Rumors of the Nore Ona, a creature said to prey on unsuspecting souls, filled the air, instilling fear in the hearts of the locals, including him. My neighbor went into more detail, shaking in terror. The wet woman is dangerous. According to the legend, she dwells near bodies of water and has the upper body of a woman and the lower body of a giant snake. She's a malevolent creature with a thirst for human blood and preys on unsuspecting individuals who venture too close to the water's edge at night. Like my wife. I lost her just last month. I found her, lifeless, squeezed to death and drained of blood just next to the lake. My neighbor cried. I felt sorry for him, but my curiosity prevailed over caution, driving me to want to learn more and end this monster. I promised him that I would be okay and hugged him. I really liked his wife. My family was long gone, so I used to visit their restaurant and chat with her as if she were a mother. Late at night, as the streets lay deserted, I approached the tranquil shores of Lake Onuma. The whispers of the legend tugged at my imagination, urging me to seek answers amidst the darkness. It was as if an invisible hand guided my steps. It was there that I saw her, a figure drenched and shivering as if she had emerged from the waters themselves. Her rosy cheeks were stained with tears. She appeared vulnerable. I hesitated, thinking about the Nore Ona, but couldn't simply leave her alone in such a state. With concern etching my voice, I approached the woman cautiously, my jacket already in my hands. Are you all right? I asked, extending the jacket to shield her from the cold night air and prepared to fight if the need arises. She turned to me, her eyes reflecting a mix of gratitude and weariness. Her name was Ayumi, and she explained that she had been caught in a sudden downpour during her spiritual journey. Intrigued by her quest for self-discovery and her desire to connect with nature, I felt an instant connection. It seemed we were both navigating the uncertain waters of life. Maybe it was fate, but something about Ayumi inspired me to change my life. Days turned into weeks, and Ayumi and I forged a deep friendship. We spent hours together, discussing our dreams, fears, and aspirations. I feel like no one ever sees me for who I truly am deep inside. I confided in Ayumi about my quarter-life crisis, finding solace in her understanding. Ayumi, in turn, shared her spiritual journey, seeking guidance from the natural world around her. One night, Ayumi invited me to join her in a unique bathing ritual at Lake Anuma. Excitement and curiosity mingled within me as I agreed to embark on this adventure. Eager to explore Ayumi's spiritual practices, but I was also cautious. How about the Nore Ona? I asked. Everyone's been saying she transforms into her half-snake, half-human form at night. Those are just rumors. Believe me, I wouldn't put your life at risk. Together we arrived at the lake. 
The moon's soft glow danced upon the water's surface, casting an enchanting spell. Yet, a sense of unease tugged at my heart, causing my steps to falter. A foreboding chill crept up my spine, and I knew this was a bad idea. I'm not sure about this, I admitted, my voice wavering. The idea of plunging into the unknown unsettled me, awakening a fear I couldn't fully articulate. Ayumi's eyes narrowed, her expression shifting from patience to frustration. Asuka, you need to do this, or else. She snapped, her voice laced with a sharp edge. Taken aback by her sudden anger, I stumbled over my words. I... I'm serious. It's just... I have this fear of deep water. I don't think it's safe here. Ayumi's face twisted with disdain, her words spewing forth like venom. Fear? You're letting fear control you? How can you be so incompetent? We're here to connect with the spirits, to embrace our true selves. But you, Asuka? You're holding us back. Her harsh words pierced my heart, the weight of her disappointment crushing me. I had hoped for understanding, for support, but instead, I found myself the target of her anger, amplifying my fear of the unknown. Ayumi's eyes flashed with impatience. You just keep making excuses, like always. She sneered. Go in, now, before I throw you in. Her words wounded me deeply. I had thought our friendship was built on empathy and understanding. But now, it felt like Ayumi had transformed into someone unrecognizable. A monster. The warmth and kindness that had drawn me to her were replaced by bitterness and aggression. Our voices rose, the argument escalating in the moonlit night. Ayumi's face twisted into a snarl, her anger unrestrained. You don't know what's good for you, Asuka, she spat. You're weak, just like everyone else. The venom in her words struck deep, but something within me shifted. In a moment of frustration, I had enough. The truth burst forth from within me. But really, I started spewing venom at Ayumi until she was paralyzed. And once again, I lost control. My eyes glowed with a coldness that sent shivers down her spine. I shed my human guise, revealing my serpent-like form. My upper half was perfectly human, but my lower half was all snake with green scaly skin glistening in the moonlight. The shock and horror that washed over Yumi's face pierced my heart for a second. Why? She whispered her voice trembling with a mix of sorrow and disbelief. I spoke, my voice dripping with cold indifference. I tried to find solace in our connection, but you're rude. I guess my destiny is to remain a monster. With a heavy heart, I lunged forward, ensnaring Ayumi within the lethal embrace of my long tongue and decapitating her head. Then I used my tail to strangle what was left of her. I blacked out. All I remembered were her cries echoing through the night, decrescendoing into silence. The lake bore witness to the tragic end of our friendship. Its once serene surface, stained by the darkness that consumed Ayumi's essence. I sighed. Another one bites the dust. I slithered back into the depths of the lake, now carrying the weight of regret and sorrow. The legend of the Noreona would forever be entwined with my own story, a reminder that even the most innocent connections can be tainted by the darkness within. Ayumi, a victim of my true nature, became a tragic figure in the tale. 
a casualty of the monster I was destined to be. Finding myself newly single, I decided to escape to a remote resort on Oshima Island with my daughter, Mia. The melancholy beauty of the island offered a tranquil refuge from the recent upheaval of our lives. Little did we know, a terror lurked beneath its surface. I chose this resort because I wanted something more secluded for my daughter. It's been a year since Mia has said a word to anyone. I thought it was a result of all the fighting between my ex and I, but months have passed since the divorce, and still not a peep. Everything at the resort seemed normal at first. The staff, always with a friendly smile, were very welcoming. They remembered our names, catered to our dietary preferences, and were always ready with suggestions for local attractions. However, even this tranquil setting couldn't ease the deafening silence between me and me. We spent the majority of the trip hanging out along the beach, but honestly, I was bored having no one to talk to. My phone didn't have reception, I couldn't even text my friends. So I focused on spending quality time with Mia, watching movies, playing board games, and playing near the water. I would do anything for my daughter to feel comfortable talking to me again. One rainy afternoon, we were in the resort's communal room after breakfast. I looked at the movies on the shelf and pulled out Snow White, since it was her favorite. Eagerly, I popped the tape into the old VCR. It took a while for it to work. Finally, it began to play. But instead of familiar animated characters, a collage of horrifying images assaulted our senses. An eclipse followed by a mirror reflecting a woman's tormented face. Then a well in a barren field. I tried to turn it off, but it didn't work. Mia's hand clenched mine as she shivered in fear. Mm. That's when my cell phone buzzed to life, startling me. Seeing an incoming call, I picked it up, only to hear an ominous voice on the other line, echoing the same words as Mia. Seven days. The person on the other line immediately hung up. I was confused and terrified at the same time. I had watched the movie ring a few times to be paranoid. But I was also a little relieved that my Mia had finally said something. During the next six nights, our tranquility was gradually shattered. On the first night, the lights would flicker at random intervals. I dismissed it as a trivial issue, attributing it to the less than perfect electrical infrastructure common in such remote locations. On the second night, I was startled by whispers that seemed to float in from nowhere. Although the chilling tone sent shivers down my spine, I quickly brushed them off as the result of staff chatter carrying over from somewhere else in the resort. On the third night, an inexplicable cold invaded our rooms. Despite the summer heat outside, our room was frigid, as though an air conditioner was working overtime. I brushed this off too, assuming the resort staff had finally gotten the erratic air conditioning unit to work effectively. The fourth night brought a series of ominous scratching sounds from within the walls. The unsettling sounds were disturbing, yet I dismissed them as the work of small animals or insects, a common occurrence given our proximity to nature on the island. The fifth night took an unnerving turn when shadows in our room began to morph into peculiar and terrifying shapes in the dim light. I justified this as a side effect of the constant stress and my overactive imagination casting ordinary objects into grotesque silhouettes. However, on the sixth night, the faucets began to drip with a liquid that disturbingly resembled blood. This gruesome spectacle was impossible to rationalize. The strange happenings of the previous nights, 
which I had so swiftly dismissed, now seemed to be sinister omens, signaling that something was seriously wrong. When I went to the front desk to complain again, no one was there. I decided we would stay the night, and if staff didn't return by morning, we would leave. Mia woke up screaming about the scary lady from the well. I couldn't sleep, so I went to the front desk and got on their computer. A sense of dread gripped me. Something was horribly wrong. I started researching the history of the resort and was chilled to the bone. We had unwillingly become part of Sadako's curse. A vengeful spirit of a psychic girl betrayed and thrown into a well to die a slow, lonely death. On the last night, the air hung heavy with terror, and I couldn't find Mia. Frantic, I searched the resort only to find her outside. Under the moonlight, her small figure making its way towards a well that wasn't on the resort's map. I sprinted after her, my heart pounding in my chest calling out her name. She seemed to be in a trance, undeterred by my pleas. I tried to stop her, but she was strong, unnaturally so, pushing me away with a force that defied her petite frame. Then, out of nowhere, Sadako made her horrifying entrance out of the well, her long hair obscuring her face. Mia snapped out of her trance and stared at the ghost in terror. I held Mia close, my heart thundering in my chest as Sadako moved towards us. But just as she lunged, Mia reacted. Her eyes flashed with resolve as she raised her small hand. The area erupted with a blinding light and crackling energy. It was my first time witnessing her psychic abilities, a stark revelation amidst the chaos. Mia's psychic power clashed with Sadako's vengeful force. A shockwave of images and emotions cascaded through my mind, including Sadako's birth, her family, then her betrayal and death. Sadako, you have to move on. Mia's voice, steady despite her fear, echoed. A sudden realization gripped me. Mia's psychic abilities weren't random. She was somehow spiritually connected to Sadako from the start. It wasn't a random haunting we were facing, but a call of recognition from a lonely spirit to a kindred soul. You didn't deserve that, believe me. Mia told her as she shared her past with her. Mia's visions were heart-wrenching, capturing scenes of her father's cruel abuse when he discovered her psychic gifts, the bitter divorce, and the suffocating silence that followed. A horrifying scream pierced the silence as Sadako trembled. Then, as if devoured by the darkness, she vanished, leaving an almost deafening silence behind. Mia, drained, collapsed into my arms. In the aftermath of the encounter, I couldn't help but marvel at Mia. She had faced her fears head on and used her psychic abilities to empathize with a tormented spirit. Even though our lives were far from ordinary now, we had survived an ordeal that had deepened our bond immeasurably. But even as relief washed over us, a lingering feeling remained. As we settled back into our room for one more night, I couldn't shake the realization that Mia's connection with Sadako was no mere coincidence. It was a call of recognition from one kindred spirit to another, and now, with her powers awakened, Mia had become a beacon for other spirits. Mia's newfound confidence and understanding of her gift seemed to usher in a new chapter in our lives. Mia was more attuned to the spiritual world, and her psychic gift was now a part of her identity. One night, as we were settling for dinner, Mia's eyes widened her gaze fixed on something in the distance. I followed her eyes, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Do you see her? I felt a chill run down my spine. She's been watching us all day. Our tranquil home had been transformed into an unpredictable space since our return from Oshima Island. 
Mia's connection to the spiritual world had opened a door that couldn't be closed, and now ghosts were making their presence known. We were on the precipice of a new journey, and I couldn't help but wonder where it would lead us. And here is the cursed house. The tour guide's voice was a haunting whisper that cut through the cold Halloween night. She stood before the group of tourists, her eyes filled with dread as she gazed upon the foreboding mansion. She continued, This house has a tragic history. It is said that the Psyche family met a fate so horrifying that their spirits still linger within these walls. Takio, the husband, was consumed by jealousy and rage leading to a horrifying act of violence that shattered this household. Kayako was his wife, a woman driven to despair by her husband's actions. Her spirit now roams these halls, her long hair concealing her face, and her voice a guttural anguished croak that echoes through the very soul of anyone who dares to enter. Her voice grew darker as she went on. Their young son, Toshio, was innocent in all of this. But he too met a tragic fate. His ghostly form can be seen playing with their pet cat. She pulled up a photo of the family on her phone. Mar, the family cat, was also a victim of this curse. Its spirit is said to lead those who enter this place deeper into the horrors that lie within. As she recounted the dark tales of the house and its cursed inhabitants, the group felt a chill run down their spines as they learned more. They learned that Takio murdered his wife in a fit of jealousy. He also killed their pet cat and their son before taking his own life. These violent and traumatic deaths left lingering negative energy in the house, which manifested as a curse. The moon hung low in the sky, casting eerie shadows on the old house. Her voice took on an urgent note. Do not enter this place. The curse that clings to it is insidious and once it takes hold, there is no escape. However, the warning seemed to fall on deaf ears as Alex, Emmy, and Mark exchanged determined glances. Once the ghost tour concluded, the three friends reconvened at a nearby cafe, sipping on hot cider to ward off the autumn chill. We should go back there, Alex suggested with a mischievous grin. Emmy and Mark hesitated for a moment, then nodded in agreement. Excitement filled their conversation as they made plans to return to the cursed house. Armed with flashlights and curiosity, they made their way back to the mansion. As they cautiously moved towards the entrance, a strange sensation washed over them. Then, as if in response to their unease, a cat materialized before them. Its eyes glowed as it fixed its gaze upon them. Emmy couldn't help herself. She knelt down and extended a hand to pet the cat which began to purr. The friends exchanged fearful glances but pressed on. The cat led them through the front door of the house, its eerie meows guiding their path through the dimly lit hall. They couldn't turn back now, but as they ventured deeper into the house, the layout seemed to change before their very eyes. The rooms became a disorienting maze, with doors that led to nowhere and hallways that twisted and turned. Panic set in as they realized that they were separated. Mark wandered through the ever-changing labyrinth of the cursed house, when he stumbled upon a room that seemed ordinary at first. It appeared to be a bedroom frozen in time. An antique dresser stood against one wall, and a mirror reflected the eerie surroundings. However, as Mark stepped further into the room, he felt the floor beneath him give way, and he tumbled into darkness. With a jolt, he landed on the cold, damp ground, gasping for air. To his horror, he found himself in a narrow subterranean chamber, partially submerged in murky water. Panic surged through him as he realized that he was trapped in a hidden basement that had remained concealed for years. The water seemed to have a presence of its own, its surface rippling ominously. Mark's heart raced as he struggled to maintain his composure, his flashlight casting eerie shadows on the water's surface. Suddenly, the room changed. The walls seemed to close in around him, and the water level began to rise steadily. 
Fear coursed through him as he realized that escape was impossible. He hammered on the damp, cold walls, desperately searching for a way out. It was then that he heard it, the faint, eerie giggle of a child. <laughs> the atmosphere grew even colder as the water in the room began to ripple and churn. Slowly from the depths of the murky water, a pale, ghostly form emerged. Toshio, the vengeful child of the Psyche family, materialized before him. An unsettling grin played upon his lips. The room's oppressive darkness closed in around them, and Mark, paralyzed by terror, watched as Toshio glided toward him. His mouth opened, and Mark could see an unnatural darkness within. Then, with an eerie and unsettling sound, black liquid oozed from Toshio's mouth, staining the water around him. Instead of words, he emitted a haunting meow, reminiscent of a tortured cat. Mark's trembling hand extended toward Toshio, but before he could react, Toshio's fingers brushed against his, sending a paralyzing chill through his entire being. The water seemed to obey Toshio's will. It continued to rise, submerging Mark as he struggled to breathe, his vision growing hazy until he couldn't fight it any longer. Mark's desperate gasps for air were drowned out by the haunting laughter of Toshio. In another part of the house, Emmy unknowingly entered a room that held a sinister secret. The air grew icy cold and the lights flickered ominously. Shadows danced on the walls, revealing a cursed shrine adorned with photographs of the Psyche family. There was Takio, his face twisted with jealousy and rage and Kayako, her eyes filled with anguish. Toshio, the young son, stared with an innocence. A chill ran down her spine. To her horror, their expressions seemed to change before her eyes. They grinned, their eyes dark. As she tried to tear her eyes away from the photographs, Kayako's voice began echoing through the room. It was a guttural, anguished croak that seemed to echo from all directions. Terrified, Emmy stumbled backward. As she rushed towards the door, her heart raced. She reached the hallway, gasping for air, and her eyes fell upon an attic door. It was partially open. Before she could think twice, a figure emerged from the other side. A ghostly, disheveled woman with long, matted black hair obscuring her face. Her eyes gleamed with malevolence as she moved towards Emmy, her joints cracking. Her body twisted and contorted in ways no living being should. It was Kayako. Emmy tried to flee, but there was no exit. Kayako's hand reached out, grasping her ankle with supernatural strength. Emmy's scream of agony pierced the air as she was dragged into the clutches of the malevolent spirit. As Emmy's scream of agony pierced the air, Kayako's hair shifted, parting to reveal her contorted face. Her eyes gleamed with malevolence as she pulled Emmy closer. Emmy's world descended into darkness as Kayako's grasp snuffed out her life, her anguished voice echoing through the cursed room. The cursed house had claimed yet another victim. Amid the horrors that enveloped them, only one of the friends, Alex, managed to escape the clutches of the cursed house. Initially, he found himself trapped in one of its darkest rooms, paralyzed and helpless. The anguished screams of his friends reverberated through the halls, tormenting his senses. Within that room, the vengeful spirit of Takeo himself held him in a paralyzing grip, forcing him to bear witness to the torment of his friends. The haunting laughter of the ghost filled the room as it relished in their suffering. Alex's body remained immobile, his heart heavy with dread as he listened. But then, Alex managed to break free from the entity's grip. His limbs surged with newfound strength, and he fought his way out of the cursed house. As he stumbled through the garden, gasping for air, he encountered the tour guide, her eyes devoid of humanity. Her voice was no longer warm and welcoming, but dripping with malice. I warned you, now you can never escape the curse. The words sent a shiver down Alex's spine. Before he could react, the tour guide's hand brushed against his sending a shock of coldness through his body. Alex felt an excruciating pain as his mind unraveled. Haunting visions and memories flooded his thoughts, 
and he clutched his head in agony. His sanity slipped away, piece by piece, and his screams joined the chorus of tormented souls trapped forever in the cursed house. The curse had claimed yet more victims, leaving a legacy of horror that would continue to draw souls into its dark embrace for all eternity. Alex would forever bear the scars of that fateful Halloween night, driven mad by the malevolence that clung to him like a shadow. The academy, typically bustling with energetic students during the day, had taken on a much more sinister energy under the gloomy veil of a Friday evening. A heavy silence blanketed the school, amplifying the eerie anticipation that hovered in the air. Amidst the haunting atmosphere, a young girl named Eddie found herself drawn towards the unknown. A falling out with her best friend had led to painful isolation. And in her desperation, she was willing to face the terrifying legend of the academy, Hanakusan of the Toilet. Climbing the ancient staircase leading to the third floor, her heart pounded with anxiety. Her desire for reconciliation pushed her forward to the girl's bathroom. As she entered, the bulb flickering cast trembling shadows across the damp tiles and walls stained with time. From the third stall, a chill draft whispered tales of the ghostly occupant, making Eddie shudder. Pushing down the rising fear, she walked towards it. Her voice trembled as she whispered into the cold silence three times. Anaku-san? Are you there? While knocking. Silence hung in the air before the door swung open. The toilet started gurgling and shaking. Then she was answered by a tiny voice so chilling that it turned Eddie's blood to ice. Yes, I'm here. Materializing from the toilet, the ghost stood. Her red skirt seemed like blood in the gloomy bathroom. Swallowing her fear, Eddie managed to stammer out her wish. I want my friend to speak to me again. I want us to be friends like before. Please grant my wish. Anaku-san considered her for a moment, the air growing colder. She was about to answer when an odd sound echoed in the toilet. It was a mix of gurgling and creaking, like an old pipe struggling to work. They turned their attention to the toilet. What on earth? Anaku-san began, her voice trailing off as the toilet seat began to shake violently. With a sudden burst, the lid flew open and a geyser of water shot up, drenching Eddie. Eddie shrieked in surprise, but Anoka-san merely raised an eyebrow in curiosity. From the chaos, another figure emerged, Anaku-kun, a boy dressed in an old-fashioned school uniform. His face held a mischievous grin, his demeanor playful, a stark contrast to the eeriness of Anoka-san. His unexpected arrival took Anoka-san aback. Phew, sorry for the lateness. What did I miss? Anaku-kun asked, looking between the stunned Eddie and unimpressed Anaku-san. Why are you here, Anaku-kun? She demanded. His nonchalant reply, I was summoned but took a wrong turn at the spirit realm, sparked off a heated argument between the two ghosts. Their voices clashed in the confined space, they bickered over their territories, their duties, and their unexpected encounter. Caught in the midst of this unexpected turn of events, Eddie could only watch, a mix of fear and fascination rooting her to the spot. When Hanoko-san finally turned her attention back to her, Eddie could hardly meet her gaze. Your wish? Hanoko-san began, her voice carrying an ominous undertone. Has a price. Your task is to face each of the mysteries of this school alone. Retrieve a charm from each to prove your encounter. Complete this, and your wish shall be granted. Fail, and it will cost you your life. Anaku-san said as her eyes sparkled with mischief. With determination, Eddie accepted the daunting task. The prospect of mending her broken friendship was her driving force. 
Her first encounter was with the Misaki stairs. She found herself navigating through an endless loop of staircases that seemed to defy the laws of physics. It was only through keen observation and quick thinking that she was able to break the loop and retrieve the first charm. Next was the 4pm library. Whispers of untold secrets and riddles filled the air as she went through an impossible maze of bookshelves. It took all her courage to stay calm, solve the riddles, and earn the second charm. For a while, Eddie persevered. However, nothing could prepare her for the hell of mirrors. Upon entering, she was confronted by a grotesque reflection of herself, a manifestation of her deepest fears and insecurities. It constantly reminded her of her loneliness, of her friend's abandonment. The relentless torment started to fracture Eddie's sanity. This alarming development caught Anoko-kun's attention, who was secretly watching. He returned to the bathroom and confronted Anoko-san, demanding they intervene to help Eddie. She can't take it anymore. The hell of mirrors is too much for her, he argued. She chose this path. It's not our place to interfere. Anaku-san dismissed his concerns. Anaku-san's casual dismissal of Anaku-kun's concerns made his blood boil. We need to help her! Their disagreement was intensifying when Anaku-san, in her usual scornful tone, said, You think you're some sort of savior? Don't make me laugh. You're just a killer, trying to wash away his guilt by playing the hero. Her words cut through Anakukun like a blade. His twin brother's death, his guilt, his endless efforts to make amends. She had thrown it all back in his face. A low growl echoed in his throat, his eyes ablaze with anger. You've gone too far. Anakusan just laughed. You've crossed the line, he yelled. He summoned his weapon a spectral knife that morphed into a larger sword. Its ethereal glow filled the bathroom as Anoku-kun charged towards Anoku-san. Anoku-san was quick to react, her own spectral energy pulling into a protective barrier that crackled and shimmered in the air. The battle between them was fierce and chaotic. The sword of Anoku-kun clashed against Anoku-san's shield. Each impact sending sparks flying and causing the very air around them to ripple with their supernatural power. Anakukun, fueled by his anger, sent wave after wave of attacks. He lashed out, his strikes becoming more forceful and desperate, each one met by Anakusan's defense. At the height of their confrontation, the bathroom was unrecognizable. The mirrors were shattered, their broken fragments scattered over the floor. Anakusan, fueled by desperation, manipulated the water from the toilets. The liquid twisted, forming into a tornado that hurtled towards Anakukun. Anakukun's form flickered in and out of solidity while retaliating with a wave of energy that shattered the bathroom stalls, showering the area with splinters of wood. Anakusan barely dodged the debris. Suddenly, a shrill scream pierced through the chaos of their battle. Both Anakukun and Anakusan froze, the terrifying cry reverberating through the bathroom. Without a word, they stopped their fight and rushed towards the source, only to find Eddie's lifeless body sprawled on the floor. The sight of the lifeless girl brought a wave of regret that washed over Anakusan. I didn't want this, she confessed quietly, her voice echoing hauntingly in the room. I merely wanted her to understand the reality of friendship. Anakukun stared at her, confused. What are you talking about? I, too, once had a friend in this school. She revealed, her spectral eyes distant. But as she grew older, she forgot about me. About our friendship. It was a harsh lesson that friendships don't always last. The confession hung heavily in the air. He knew the pain of being forgotten, left behind by the relentless march of time. Slowly, he reached out and placed a hand on her shoulder. You're not alone anymore. With a surprised look, 
Anoka-san turned to face him. The shared understanding sparked an unlikely alliance, born from the shared guilt and the resolve to prevent any more students from meeting a fate like Eddie's. Next time, Anaku-kun declared, a glimmer of hope in his eyes. We'll make sure to guide them better. Together. Their decision marked the start of a new partnership. The school bathroom, once the site of their heated battle, became the symbol of their shared commitment. As the guardians of the school, Anaku-kun and Anaku-san vowed to guide their summoners together. Hero's heart pounded in his chest as he sprinted through the chilling darkness. He cast terrified glances over his shoulder, catching glimpses of shadows. Panic gripped him, urging him to run faster, to escape. In the corner of his eye, Hiro caught a fleeting image, a flicker of movement. Adrenaline surged through Hiro's veins as he pushed himself harder. The chilling wind seemed to carry whispers that sent shivers down his spine. Suddenly, the ground gave way beneath him, and Hiro tumbled into a pit of darkness. The impact stole his breath, and he found himself engulfed in a suffocating abyss. Panic gripped him as he gasped for air, his vision growing hazy, and a haunting laughter echoed through the void. With a jolt, Hiro's eyes flew open, his body drenched in a cold sweat as his hands instinctively flew to his neck. Hiro's breathing gradually steadied as he lay there, his mind still entangled in the remnants of the vivid nightmare. Reality seeped in. He found himself in an unfamiliar room, the cozy quarters of a small inn. Slowly, his memories flooded back in, and he recalled that he was backpacking through Asia. He remembered that he had sought refuge here for the night. Shrugging off the remnants of the nightmare, Hiro swung his legs over the edge of the bed and rose to his feet. He decided to embrace the morning and wander through the village. As he approached the inn's entrance, the concierge greeted him with a nod and a warm smile. Stepping into the morning air, Hiro inhaled deeply, the scent of blooming flowers mingling with the cool breeze. He passed by locals, attractive faces that seemed to erase the lingering unease of his dream. Entering a small restaurant, Hiro found a friendly waitress who took his order with a smile that seemed to radiate warmth. After a hearty breakfast, Hiro stepped back onto the village's cobblestone streets. He glanced around, the realization gradually dawning on him as he exchanged nods and greetings with the villagers. They were all women. A peculiar sensation tingled at the back of his mind, and a growing sense of being watched made him uncomfortable. As Hiro ventured further, the friendly gazes began to shift. The once welcoming expressions turned into cold, disdainful stares that followed him. Hiro felt like an intruder in a world that was not his own. He wandered through narrow alleyways, past shops, and beneath the shade of cherry blossom trees. Yet he couldn't find a single friendly face to meet his gaze. Seeking refuge in a small park nestled on the outskirts of the village, Hiro sat on a bench. He gazed out at the serene landscape, his mind a whirlwind of confusion and apprehension. The events of the past few hours were as puzzling as they were unsettling, and he found himself yearning for an escape from the tense atmosphere. As Hiro pondered his next move, a voice, gentle and welcoming, cut through his thoughts. He looked up to find a woman around his age standing there. Her eyes held a warmth that was a stark contrast to the unfriendly stares he had encountered earlier. Mind if I join you? She asked, her voice soft and inviting. Hiro nodded, his curiosity piqued. Of course, please. They fell into an easy conversation. She shared stories about the village, its history, its traditions, and the tight-knit community that resided there. Hiro, in turn, opened up about his own travels, sharing snippets of his adventures across Asia. As the hours passed, their camaraderie deepened, and before Hiro knew it, they were heading to a local eatery for lunch. Eyes watched with a mixture of intrigue and surprise as they walked together. The woman's presence seemed to command respect, her smile eliciting nods and greetings from those they passed. 
Over lunch, Hiro couldn't help but notice the way the villagers reacted to her. It was clear that she held a special place in their community. Through their conversation, Hiro learned more about the woman's role within the village, her dedication to preserving its traditions. As lunch concluded, Hiro and the woman continued to walk through the village, talking effortlessly. As the sun began its descent, Hiro and the woman reached a crossroads. The impending parting seemed to carry a tinge of disappointment, yet Hiro knew he had gained a valuable ally. Just before they went their separate ways, the woman's gaze held his for a moment. She leaned in and planted a soft kiss on Hiro's lips. The touch of her lips sent a shockwave of surprise through him. With a smile, she murmured, You have no idea how lonely it's been, not having men around. Hiro's heart raced as he absorbed her words. He sensed an unspoken invitation in her gaze, a longing. Hiro found himself saying, If you'd like, we could spend more time together. I have a room in the inn. Her smile deepened. I'd like that, she replied. Hiro's heart pounded as he watched her walk away. The evening air was charged with anticipation as Hiro prepared for the night ahead. His thoughts were consumed by the woman he had met, a connection that felt like a dream. Hiro waited in his room, his pulse quickened with every passing minute. But as the hours stretched on, hope began to grow impatient. The evening slipped away into the embrace of darkness, yet she didn't come. Frustration simmered within Hiro. He cursed under his breath. With an exasperated sigh, he fell onto the bed, cursing the woman and the village that seemed to thrive on secrets and manipulation. Soon his resentment was replaced with exhaustion. He drifted into an uneasy sleep. In the dead of the night, Hiro's slumber was shattered by eerie sounds, creaks, whispers, and the distant rustling of fabric. His eyes snapped open, and he turned on the lights. The room was empty, but his windows were wide open. His senses were on high alert as he listened to the sounds that seemed to reverberate through the inn. Driven by curiosity, Hiro swung his legs over the edge of the bed and crept toward the door. The noises seemed to lead him. Hiro's heart raced as he navigated the inn's hallways. Fear gnawed at his insides, yet he pressed on, compelled by a force he couldn't comprehend. A shiver coursed through him as he turned a corner, and there, bathed in darkness, stood a figure, the woman he had met. But as Hiro's gaze locked onto her, a shudder raced down his spine. Her face held no expression, an eerie void. You made me wait. He took a step back in anger. The woman's voice, once soft and inviting, now seemed to resonate with an otherworldly echo. Patience, dear traveler, she said. It's time you understood. Suddenly, she moved forward, her face slowly coming into view. Hiro's breath caught as the shadows revealed her neck, elongated, contorted, and utterly terrifying. Arokuro Kubi. The truth struck him like a lightning bolt. The connection he had felt had been nothing more than a facade, concealing the creature's true form. As Hiro's breath quickened, he took an instinctive step back. His gaze remained locked on the once familiar face, now contorted into a horrifying visage. With a chilling roar, the Rokurokubi's elongated neck surged forward, snaking through the air. Hiro staggered backward, his mind racing for a means of escape. The woman's voice, once soothing, now reverberated with a malevolence that sent shivers down Hiro's spine. You are not welcome here, she hissed, the words dripping with venom. In an instant, the woman twisted into something nightmarish, her features distorting into an embodiment of horror that defied the limits of reality. With a surge of terror, Hiro attempted to back away, but his retreat was cut short by the advancing figure. The Rokurokubi's elongated neck snaked toward him, its approach relentless. In a desperate bid for escape, Hiro turned and fled toward the village. But he was confronted by an unsettling sight. All the women of the village had gathered, holding hands, forming an impenetrable barrier that blocked his path. With his heart racing, Hiro's instincts kicked in, and he attempted to push his way through the crowd. But the women held their ground. 
The Rokurakubi's presence loomed behind him, laughing. <laughs> as his struggles grew more desperate, her long neck wrapped around his throat. Darkness began to claim his vision, his struggles growing weaker as the creature's grip intensified. In his peripheral vision, the women of the village stood, laughing. And then, in a grotesque twist that sent a fresh wave of terror coursing through him, the Rokurokubi opened her mouth wide, revealing sharp fangs. As her teeth sunk into his neck, an agonized <gasps> gasp escaped Hiro's lips. His vision flickering as a surge of searing pain engulfed him. Darkness enveloped him, the taste of fate's cruel game bittersweet on his lips. The village, a boundary between dream and nightmare, ensnared him in its unforgiving grip. My lifelong fascination with Japanese urban legends always drew me towards the bizarre and mysterious. So when I heard about the legend of Gosu, also known as the Cowhead, a spirit rumored to reside in the small Suganuma village in Japan, my curiosity was instantly piqued. My friends Hiroshi and Yuki joined me. We spent a few days getting to know the village speaking with locals and piecing the story together like a puzzle. I wanted to unravel the reason behind its madness and discover its villain origin story. We learned that the cowhead was birthed from a powerful demon, summoned by a group of villagers who failed to provide a sacrifice of one of their livestock to end a series of famines in the 17th century. In retaliation, the demon cursed one of the villagers, turning him into the cowhead, a vengeful spirit destined to haunt the village eternally, said to possess the head of a cow and a body reminiscent of a human. Out of desperation and starvation, the locals hunted and feasted on it. We also learned that many villagers had recently passed away because Gozu had returned and was seeking revenge, sharing his curse with others. Despite all this, my friends and I were ready for the adventure. And Hiroshi, a man of science, wanted a rational explanation for this supernatural mystery. One afternoon, we dined at our favorite local restaurant savoring our delicious bowls of tender gyudon. All of a sudden, the owner rushed us out. As we stepped onto the sidewalk, I felt a sense of unease amongst the locals. With the street clearing out and the shops closing early, the village was gripped by an eerie silence. Then a low, strange growl echoed down the deserted street. It was coming from a small farmhouse. Compelled by curiosity and hunger for the unknown, we trespassed into the abandoned house. As we braved the dark, musty interior, a silhouette emerged from the shadows. We found ourselves face to face with a beast. It bore the terrifying form we had been told to expect, a big head and body. Its movements were awkward. Upon closer inspection, we noticed something deeply disturbing about the creature. Its skin was pale and stretched tightly over its skeletal frame. Its eyes were devoid of the supernatural malevolence we expected from a vengeful spirit, replaced instead with an expression of vacant confusion. It produced pitiful low moans that were more reminiscent of someone in pain than a malevolent spirit. Its erratic behavior suggested a lack of control, possibly a symptom of advanced neurological degeneration. Hiroshi recognized these symptoms. They closely resembled the final stages of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, more commonly known as mad cow disease, which had been known to cross species barriers and affect humans. As we examined the creature closer, we noticed its visage held more sickness than wickedness. The unfortunate creature was not the dreaded cowhead, 
but a victim of a terrible disease that was ravaging the local farming community. This realization offered a moment of relief. Laughing nervously, Hiroshi and Yuki mimic the creature's moans and mood as we exit the house to warn the locals about their contaminated meat, oblivious to the horror awaiting us. The streets were empty and a foreboding sense of doom hung in the air. The quiet night was broken by the sound of hooves. Emerging from the shadows was a terrifying sight. It was a creature with a disproportionately large head adorned with two imposing horns and eerie glowing eyes that radiated malice. And holding a butcher knife, its muscular human-like body covered in coarse dark fur lent an intimidating air to its already monstrous form. It started bellowing in anger. It was clear we weren't welcome. It lowered its head and pointed its horns towards us, and scraped the ground with its hooves, further signaling its agitation and readiness to charge. It fixated on Hiroshi first, and a chase ensued. I managed to run and find refuge in a dumpster, but my friends weren't as fortunate. One by one, their screams echoed in the night. The cow head's attack was as unique and terrifying as the creature itself. It possessed a deadly combination of supernatural speed, agility, and strength. Its primary form of assault was its chillingly powerful voice. It unleashed an unearthly bellow that shattered the windows and disoriented its victims. I watched as this sonic attack left my friend stunned and vulnerable. It used its large, powerful skull to headbutt Hiroshi first. Hiroshi fell to the ground. Then Gozu struck him with his large knife, chopping until all that was left was a pile of mush. Then it turned to Yuki, who was trying to flee, but was cornered. Despite its massive form, the cow had navigated through the dark with ease. It used its sharp and deadly horns to pierce through him with a swift and powerful strike. It trampled him, running back and forth in anger until his body became ground up meat. Then it huffed and puffed and walked away from what was left of them. Traumatized and alone, I stayed in my hiding spot until morning quiet and trying not to hurl. I finally emerged from my hiding place and fled the village. I attempted to return to normalcy, but I knew I wasn't safe. It was just the beginning of my ultimate demise. In the weeks that followed my escape from Suganuma, I began to suffer from insomnia. My nights haunted by the terrifying vision of the cow head and the gruesome fate of Hiroshi and Yuki. During the day, I couldn't shake off the constant anxiety and depression. I was a prisoner in my own home and mind, captive to the terrifying events of that fateful night. Slowly but surely, I started noticing the onset of physical symptoms. I was constantly dizzy and weak, the room spinning around me as I tried to navigate even the most mundane tasks. My appetite vanished, and I found myself wasting away, a shell of the person I once was. It wasn't long before the tremors set in. At first, it was just my hands. But soon, my entire body shook with uncontrollable convulsions. In the rare moments of lucidity, I realized the horrifying truth. I had contracted the same disease that had claimed the unfortunate villagers of Suganuma. I was no longer afraid of the beast that had haunted my dreams. Instead, I was terrified of the invisible enemy that was slowly destroying me from the inside. The disease progressed rapidly, and I found myself bedridden, trapped in my deteriorating body. I was the newest victim of the mad cow disease, destined to live out the rest of my days in suffering. 
the worst part? There was no escaping it. There was no cure. As my world shrank, I found myself reflecting on the events of that horrifying night. The laughter, the fear, the chase, the tragedy, the meals I enjoyed with my friends. It all played out in my mind in a ceaseless loop. Perhaps Gozu was now protecting cows from having a similar fate to his, and cursing those who dared feast it on its meat. Resigned to my fate, I accepted a shortened life filled with suffering, isolation, and the haunting memory of the cowhead. In the end, I was left with a cruel twist of irony. I was a victim, not just of the disease, but of my own curiosity, my own ignorance, my own insanity.